Hello everyone. Hi. So good for you all to join us. So we've got um, Zoom on a function whereby if you want to be able to ask a question, if you tap the participants button at the bottom of your screen, you'll see your name next to you. And if you click more next to your name, then you can virtually raise a hand and then we can unmute you and direct a question to B, who is our lovely speaker. So if we don't have any questions yet, which we might do, or you might be ruminating on it or working out how it works, to be fair. I have a question for you, B. You Go obviously ahead. went to the Scandinavia, to Sweden, and to, sorry, to Norway. Um, what preparation and research did you do for your trip before you went? The preparation was mostly a quick you know it was, it was fairly hands-on and fairly practical I didn't take an academic approach of you know archives and, and textual preparation so much as how the hell am I going to track a toddler <laughs> around uh, on you know boats trains ferries and small wooden vessels um, that was quite a big distraction and I was actually quite anxious about it so naturally I immersed myself very very deeply in her texts and her writings um, and then the biographer that I mentioned just before in the video, uh, of whom I'm a, a huge fan, um, Footsteps by Richard Holmes, was, was very influential on me. He's written, he did, hasn't done an actual biography of Wollstonecraft, but he's written a lot about her, um, her, her children, well, it her sort of uh, legacy children, if you like, Shelley. Shelley and Percy Bish, as I like to call him, Shelley <laughs> being Shelley. And uh, so, it, yeah, it was a more of an immersion preparation and a sort of pa increasing panic as I, as I set off on the day. And then attempted to sort of fit it in carefully afterwards because, um, you know, the limits of travelling with a toddler are such that, you know, well, you can imagine perhaps it's, it's uh, you, you can't do things for very much longer than sort of 45 minutes. But it's amazing what you can get packed into that. And also he was a brilliant sort of passport into people's homes and into people's lives. So, and Wollstonecraft herself remarks on the same thing, that it draws, it elicits a kind of tenderness, a tender sympathy from strangers. So it's quite handy, actually. My kids are available for hire. Scandinavia with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's such a good point. And I suppose with that immersion into the text, it, a trip like that is so instinctual. And Mary Wollstonecraft sort of, as you're reading it, it's more about her interior journey rather than a travel log so and I guess so. that's why you sort of spookily were led to her favorite hill almost by accident and it's not really on a map like you might have done loads of research and never found it but it was just meant to happen yes and also in this sort of journalistic tradition I had to also to rely on people that I was planning to meet in certain meetings that I'd set up and they connected me with other people and so to a certain extent we were just kind of winging it and, um, you know, with varying degrees of success. So we, we met amazing people that, that weren't planned at the beginning. Um, we met people that were actually hostile to her legacy and other sort of fellow fanatics. Um, it was the most extraordinary travel. Oh, wow, wow. Um, and we've um, got a question through, oh, sorry, Leo. Um, oh, yeah. Can you see that on the chat or do you want me to read it out? Uh, I can't see it on the chat, so I'll let you. <laughs> so we've got one from Twitter, um, from Laurie Mulligan Davis. And she says, with what um, you were saying about Edmund Burke, do you think Edmund Bertram is in no way a namesake of Edmund Burke? I don't know. Hmm. He's quite, I suppose, Edmund Bertram, he sort of, he is a bit uh, kind of stuffy, isn't he? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm... It, 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 gathered people in this room. Does anyone have an answer for that? Because I'm going to yeah. unmute Devony. Sorry to put you on the spot, Devony, but you are yeah. a great Austinite. So, Devony, what is your opinion on that? <laughs> I, no, I think Edmund's a, a common enough name that I wouldn't make that direct linkage, but it certainly mm -hmm. would have been in people's minds reading it, right? Um, and Burke, I am much more on Team Wollstonecraft than Team Burke, <laughs> but of course he did support the American yeah. Revolution, and there are there are other things about him that would have been known to people at this time that might make his reputation then a little more complex, maybe than it seems to us now. Is that fair to say, B? Do you think? Definitely agreed. I mean, he was a, he was a huge figure and a very a very vital figure and a 
powerful writer. His writings on the sublime, for example, were definitely influential on Wollstonecraft as she travelled in landscapes that were literally sublime. Um, so, yes, I mean, he, everybody was aware of him. As to the sort of commonness of his name, I can't really say. I, I imagine it was, yes, one of those very widely, widely common names. But if we're going to take Mansfield and say that that means something, I understand why people want to go to Edmund and say that it means something. And mm. uh, you know, I, it's interesting. I wouldn't say my opinion is that it's nothing, but I'm, yeah. I'm not willing to make the correlation, is my opinion. I wonder. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Interesting. I actually asked a question on Twitter too, you might see there. <laughs> oh, sorry. I just didn't want to have too many screens going at the no, same no, I just time. No, no, I, I, was, I, was, I didn't know if I was going to be able to get into the Zoom. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you'd talk more about the presence of little Fanny and how that made your recreation of the journey and uh, knowing her fate, right? Knowing her sad fate, oh, how that- I know, it's awful. How that had an impact on your journey or your writing or I'd just love to hear you say more about that part of this. I, in, in Letters from Norway, you really see a side to Wollstonecraft that you don't get in other areas of her writing. It really is extraordinary. And the parts that are most heartbreaking are the bits where she's utterly devastatedly heartbroken over Gilbert Imlay and the bits where she's watching her baby sleep or imagining her baby's tiny footprints on the sand um, or looking at her baby's cheeks you know as, as, as the baby sleeps and you know I was with my baby I mean he's right here now um, on you know Minecraft opposite me in a bad mood it's the lockdown syndrome but he was very cute and he was the exact same age as little Fanny at this time and so of course, that's that's just another connection. And and as a writer, I mean, I'm not a biographer. I, I wasn't writing a biography per se of Wollstonecraft. It was um, a sort of a biographical experiment in which I attempted to gain proximity to what she lived in order to to look at her writing through that. And so taking a baby along was was helpful in that way. But but yes, it, it just, it really, really helps to humanize her. And that I, I am a bit of a sucker for that. I love it when someone whose mind and legacy you admire is also admirable in other ways. And so it gave me other connections, other ways of sort of anchoring to her. I'm not sure if she, if she would have approved of that because it would have been very sort of, um, you know, sensibility, wouldn't it really, to have uh, focused over much on that aspect of her travels. She doesn't go a bundle on it, but the, the little bits that you get are, are so charming. They're so very tender. Oh, lovely. And we've got a question from the audience. Laura, I'm going to unmute you now. Thank you. Hi. Hi Laura. <laughs> Hello. I've enjoyed your talk immensely. This is so fascinating. <laughs> Um, I was curious how long it took for Mary Wollstonecraft's writings to cross the Atlantic and become available in the States. Well, I hope my American friends in the room will help me out here, but my understanding is that she has gained traction there far more effectively than she did here. I do know that Elizabeth Cady Stanton quoted her, and didn't, didn't only quote her, but sort of almost made her into a meme by saying that we are, what was it she said, we're crucifying our Wollstonecrafts. Um, and uh, Emma Goldman has also written incredibly beautifully as to the chronology of how she incrementally, you know, I don't want to say colonized, but entered the American mindset. I, I'm not qualified to say, but I do know that some of the, the, the best friends that she's had in her, you know, hundred years of solitude, as I like to call it, came from the other side of the Atlantic and continue to be actually, I'm chair of the Mary on the Green campaign. So we've been campaigning for years and fundraising to try and get the funds together to put up a memorial to her in the place where she lived and worked. And it's constantly been our allies in, in the United States who've said, you know, I can't believe that a person of this stature has no serious, no significant memorial anywhere. Mm -hmm. So she has a lot, a lot of friends stateside, I'm glad to report. <laughs> do you know of any, Laura, do you know of any um, particular moments at which she sort of glimpses into American history? I mean, I was curious, I've been reading Lucy Stone's letters recently, and she does refer to the vindication of the rights of women frequently. Um, but I've also been doing some reading and research about sort of American women writers at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, like Mercy Otis Warren. And I wondered if there were any possibility that Wollstonecraft's writings sort of came over that early, 
or whether there was a long lag time. Well, uh, Abigail Adams is known to have been, a, you know, don't, what was it, don't forget the ladies. And mm -hmm. apparently there, there is correspondence. There is, um, Adams wrote, of course, you know, second US president wrote, um, thanks Mary Wollstonecraft for her enduring fascination with the American Revolution and her support of it. And uh, there's a quote, uh, may, Miss, Miss W, long may we enjoy your estimation. So there was definitely some, you know, and, and I'm told that his edition of the vindication was, was very carefully annotated. So it, wouldn't that be wonderful if that were the case with today's president? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Just what a sort of amazing piece of history that would be. Um, yes, yeah, so, so certainly there, but how, how to track that forwards as a kind of piece of electricity moving through history, I don't know. It's a map that I would love to, I would love to see. And if anybody here has further info on that, I'd love to know. That's, my, that's exactly what I was looking for. I'll go and find that letter of John Adams. Thank you. Oh, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Splendid. Yeah. Um, I've got a comment on the chat from Devaney. He says, and of course, Wollstonecraft's brother, Charles, was actually in the US, right? And she says, I yes. think I have that right. <laughs> <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, yeah, they got around the Wollstonecrafts. Of course, you know, the neighborhood of Wollstonecraft in Sydney is, uh, you know, another descendant. So they, they did get around a fair amount. And for, for herself, I mean, Wollstonecraft was an extraordinary traveler as well. Um, always wanted to go to, the, to, to America, but never, never made it. I think had she, had she not died age 38, I think that would have been a move that she would have undertaken. Mm. And my colleague Kim has asked me to pass on the question. Sorry, Cleo. <laughs> um, she just said she wanted to ask how much Mary was responsible for the care of her daughter during the journey. So was she doing the breastfeeding? How much did her maid or nurse do? And do we know? Wollstonecraft was a big advocate for breastfeeding and disapproved of wet nurses. And actually, when she died, was compiling notes and, and sort of a big policy statement about early years childcare. So it was an enduring preoccupation of hers. However, she did take a maid with her on this trip, a woman called Marguerite. Um, poor old Marguerite, I actually felt quite sorry for her because <laughs> she was quite timid, didn't enjoy all these arduous boat journeys, was a little bit afraid of foreigners and just thought the whole enterprise was bonkers. <laughs> you can see that Wollstonecraft just has no truck with this. You know, she's, she's fairly forthright about that at several times uh, during Letters from Norway. And then a few, a few times, actually, I, when I was struggling with, with, you know, the difficulty of not, for example, knowing where we were going to sleep that night and how do I arrange this with my toddler, I did, upon occasion, think, girl, Wollstonecraft, you know, how dare you grumble? You had a maid. <laughs> I've got nobody. Um, so she, she, had, she had backup, but, you know, not as much backup as, as most people would have needed at the time. And for the parts of the journey that she did solo, of course, she was completely solo. I've um, got a question about the letters themselves um, and how it compared to your journey. So when you read um, Mary Wollstonecraft's letters, they're very acerbic sometimes a bit a bit she doesn't basically she doesn't pull her punches but she says mm -hmm. the swedes peak themselves on their politeness but far from being polish of a cultivated mind it consists merely of tiresome forms of ceremonies did you was that your experience of no i mean she goes a lot ruder than that she says oh they're all fat they're breasting they've got horrible teeth she's so phenomenally rude um, yeah you say she doesn't hold her punches i mean it's quite shocking really um she doesn't she, she didn't love it's, it's very funny i mean it's a lot of the rudeness is, is, is i wonder if she's playing it for comical effect i've actually got also, the quote here I'm not sure if this is historically entirely correct, but I'm pretty certain she's the first British traveller to sleep under a duvet as well, because she describes sleeping in this ghastly wooden box filled under a bag of down, downy feathers, and she thinks she's going to suffocate overnight. And you think, well, yeah, that, that, that's what we now call a duvet. We, British people didn't have those then. So she was a, 
a pioneer in so many ways. Um, but as to the rudeness, you know, she also deals out a lot of goodness and she loves the Norwegians. She considers them the, among the most liberated and the most um, justice oriented people that she's met. And she observes very keenly the way that people treat the poor, the way they treat prisoners. There's lots of talk about um, the judicial system, um, how, they, how they treat their royals, how they treat their servants. Uh, and these are things that she goes along from country to country observing very acutely but with healthy side portions of Wollstonecraft scorn, you're right. Mm. Did you try the pickled herrings that she sort of oh, says yeah. pollutes her oh, enjoyment? I'm a big fan of pickled herrings. I ate as much raw meat as I could lay my hands on. I mean, raw fishy bites. And um, what's the other Norwegian thing that I forced myself to love? Brunost. Does anybody know that? It's this block of... <laughs> it's like a... <laughs> it's this brown stuff in a block that looks like it's been extruded as a sort of uh, industrial effluent, which masquerades as cheese and the Norwegians love it. And I guess it's like our version of Marmite. So I thought, well, I just have to like this. I've got to eat it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, moving on from brown cheese. <laughs> we've, um, we've got a question from Trudy here. <laughs> hiya, hiya, Trudy. Let's see, can you top moldy cheese? Not so much a question as I just, um... I've been doing some research on Wollstonecraft as part of the Wollstonecraft reading group that Emma Clear is involved in. And oh, um, yes. when I was trying to find things, I, I came across just on, on when she was in America, um, I came across something from America dated 1799, if that helps at all. Um, it was fragments, posthumous fragments. She was dead by then. Of, well, posthumous. Yeah of Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, author of Vindication of the Rights of Women, Philadelphia, printed Philadelphia, 1799. Just one little contribution. Great. So, Laura, um, take note of that. That's splendid. <laughs> Trudy. I love this, the team effort here. <laughs> Great, thank, thank you so much, Trudy. And now we've got a, a question from Devaney. So I'll unmute you, Devaney. Are you on say YouTube? more, Sorry. Be, uh, hi. Uh, hi, I'd love to hear you say more about the where things are at during the lockdown with Mary on the Green and where you see them going next. This is oh. being recorded, so more yes. people hear it too, right? Okay, so everybody, if you're not um, already uh, logged into Mary on the Green, please do so. Sign up on the Mary on the Green website for our newsletters because we are now fully funded for the memorial artwork. Yes! Um, and not only that, but it's going to be by an extraordinary artist. Um, so the work is happening uh, and the work was well underway and we had a date and it was supposed to be in June and it was, you know, it's just been one thing after another. Um, but, you know, obviously safety is paramount and it's, it's a very much a community effort. So it's going to be a question of um, the artwork is, is happening. And if you if you sign up, we'll just let you know as 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 soon as it can be. It's it's really exciting though. I find it it just gives me chills the idea that there's going to be a really big significant memorial that big gangs of school kids can go and look at. Hmm. And B, do you want to talk about your um, your fellowship as well? Yes. So I mean, there are a number there are a number of really wonderful uh, Wollstonecraft. We're, we're a whole sort of like Wollstonecraft gang. Um, um, uh, somebody mentioned Professor Emma Clary. So she has uh, the Wollstonecraft Society, uh, sorry, the Wollstonecraft Fellowships. See, I'm, the Wollstonecraft Society is my one. <laughs> That's what it's just a great big sisterhood. Um, Wollstonecraft Society is a, a human rights education charity. So we're looking at educational materials, particularly for sort of um, kids from excluded backgrounds. And we're just up and starting. We've got um, registered uh, status now as a charity. Um, Emma's um, enterprise is, is also fabulous. It's full of research and newly brought together anthologies. So look that up with Wollstonecraft Fellowship. Um, so there's a number of different things going on. If you search up New Unity as well, which is the, the newly refurbished chapel, which is where Wollstonecraft um, listened to sermons and, and met her amazing radical friends, all the dissenters. So that's also just been renovated and was about to reopen when Corona happened. So yeah, I mean, it's all still happening. It's just happening online. And um, I guess the important thing is if you're interested to, to connect somehow so that we don't lose you and keep, you know, keep you as part of the momentum. So thank you for your interest in that. It will happen. 
Speaking of Emma Cleary, actually, she has submitted a question via Twitter. <laughs> um, so she says, um, she's wondering, why do you think it's yeah, so important? Sorry. Louise, oh. we lost you there. Oh, sorry, I think the connection in the house is not great. <laughs> is that better? Can you hear me? <laughs> Have we got a message from Emma? We've got a message from Emma. Oh, yes, you can hear me now, yeah. Yeah, she says, she's wondering, why do you think it's so important to take Mary's message to young people? That's a good question. It's Mary Wollstonecraft's life's work was about young people. That's what she wanted to do. She was an educator. That is everything that she cared about. Education is underpins everything that she did, whether it be being a setting up a small school or all of her writing. Every endeavor was about educating. And of course, we know that she cared about justice above all else. So what could be more important than conveying her message of justice for all, of equality? So young people today, I just, I just think, you know, more than ever in, in times of great division, in times of isolation um, and confusion, that it's just, it's, it's a very... It's a very simple and clear message. Wollstonecraft's message is so kind of, it so underpins everything else. I find there's great clarity in her human rights writing. Um, it's just so, it's like such fresh oxygen to read the basics of human rights and why we qualify as human beings and what it is that makes us human, that we are works in progress, that we are, that we have improvable faculties. Um, I, and that to me speaks to the education of young people and I, that, I find that so exciting. Wonderful answer. I think we're coming to the end of our time now because we've got Devonie's talk next. So uh, if we want people to have time to maybe get a cup of tea um, beforehand. So be if there are any other comments you'd like to round off. I'll follow up now on socials. So, so if I didn't get any questions in, please carry on and I'll, I will find them eventually. Thank you so much for coming along, everybody. Thank you. Yes, thank you everyone for joining. It's been absolutely great. And now if you oh, follow us online, you will find Devonie's talk is due to go live on YouTube in five minutes time. So get ready. Thank you everyone. Cool. See you there. Thank you. Bye. Bye.